One of the things that viewers have been asking me about has to do with languages and what languages I, I know or use in my, my work and how I acquired them and I think there's kind of an interesting sort of stories there, um, different stories for different languages. So I'm making this video just to talk about languages. I'm not actually going to talk about um, how I think people ought to learn languages. I'll talk a little bit about different styles or approaches to it, but I'll just tell you about how how I ended up with the languages that, that I've got that I use as, as research tools. So obviously, of course, um, I don't need to talk about English because I, I'm a native speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm an American and grew up in Wisconsin and uh, you can hear my, my accent, which is interestingly enough from what linguists tell us, the uh, same accent as people use in this part of New York. Um, but that's a whole different uh, discussion. So I'm going to talk about each one of the, the main four languages that I use in my, my work as a philosopher. That's French, German, Latin, and Classical Greek. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the other languages I've dabbled with and admittedly have, have made very, very little progress with. So French is a language that I started out with very early on, in part advantaged because my family is actually French-Canadian. Um, they've been here in the States for, in, from, from my perspective, five generations. My great-great-grandfather fought in the American Civil War he crossed the border to take the place of a doctor's son. Back then you could hire somebody to take your place if you got drafted or conscripted. And he ended up um, staying in, in the United States up in New England. And our, our family name, which is Lemries, lost a few of the letters because apparently he couldn't, he couldn't spell it or somebody else wrote it down wrong. And they stayed in that area for quite a while. My grandfather's generation as kids, they ended up moving to Chicago and growing up in Chicago, um, but they grew up, back then Chicago was divided into a whole bunch of little ethnic districts and they grew up in an ethnic district that was largely French Canadian and interestingly enough Menominee Indian. The French Canadians and, and various uh, Native American tribes have had long standing connections. As a matter of fact, the city of Milwaukee was actually founded by a uh, French-Canadian, uh, Menominee Indian couple, the Junots, who, who um, started things off there. So in any case, um, you would think that everybody would have learned English, but not all of them did. And all the way down to my mom's generation, French was spoken in, in the house, and my mom didn't learn English, even though she would have been at that point a fourth-generation Im immigrant, until she went to elementary school. And the main reason she learned it was because the Irish girls would pick on her and, and she, you know, because she didn't know English. So I grew up in a household where, like it or not, you, you heard a lot of French. And my mom would speak French to me. My dad, of course, um, didn't, didn't speak French. Well, he learned a little bit so he could, he could understand things. Um, but the older people, and, and my family was very, you know, closely connected. We spent a lot of time together. The older people would speak French back and forth. Um, and I, I guess I just sort of picked up some of it on the way. I also learned how to swear in French very early on from my, my uncle. So, you know, things, before I even know what they meant, like calles and emojis, you know, things like that. Um, so, it was, it was kind of an interesting situation. I knew some French. I didn't usually speak French with my mom, but she would sometimes say things like, you know, allons-y. And when we cross, you know, we'd go, go past a graveyard, we'd, we'd say a prayer in French, you know, bon Jésus miséricorde. And I assimilated some of that, but that's not yet learning a language. And she wanted me to know French. And she could see that the kids in my generation were, were really not picking up on the French. And she thought it would be a useful thing for me to have. So when I was in middle school, and then when I was in high school, she, she made me sign up for taking French classes. And, of course, the teachers expected a lot from me because I was supposed to, you know, have something on the ball. And I was kind of a rebellious kid, so I did just enough work to get by, didn't learn an awful lot, didn't apply myself. And now fast forward 
um, past my army time and into college. When I first got to college, they knew that I knew French. So they, they were doing this experimental program where they would have these, these suites. And there would be three uh, rooms in the suite that would be people who are supposed to be learning the language and then one, one native speaker. And they had a French suite and a, a German suite and a Spanish suite and a Japanese suite. So they threw me into the French suite along with uh, a guy who I'm, I'm still friends Well, actually two people who I'm, I'm still friends with uh, uh, 20 years later. And... Um, we, we had to take French classes, and I, I admittedly kind of screwed off in, in those classes as well. Uh, you know, I could get by um, without doing an awful lot of work, and I was kind of lazy. Um, but I did learn uh, a, lot of, a lot of useful stuff, and I would talk with our, our teacher, uh, Cecile, who was living with us. And we'd also go out drinking and, and things like that, so, you know, that, that was kind of a spur for me. Um, then after... I graduated, um, I decided it was time to buckle down and actually learn French. I, I took a year in between undergraduate and graduate school, and during that time I really concentrated on languages, in part because I wanted to go to Europe and travel around a bit. So I buckled down and I got myself some French textbooks, and I started working my way through things, and I actually started learning about the tense structure that I, I was supposed to learn about before. And, you know, I was finding it coming fairly, fairly easily. I have a facility for languages. Um, and then it was time to start, to start reading. And so that's what I did. I started, um, I have a few props here that I'm going to show you. I started reading uh, Baudelaire and, and, and trying to translate the poems myself, which is very challenging. Um, this is a book I had very early on. It's, it's deliberately written in a fairly simple style, Camus l'étranger, you know, the, the, the stranger. Um, and then once I, then I went to, to Europe, well actually I went to Quebec first with my friend Ed, and then after that I went to Europe and um, traveled around for a while and stayed with friends and just kept on improving my, my, my language, um, bought a lot of books, and then I, I got out and, and uh, came to graduate school down in southern Illinois. So I came to SIU with, with a good um, solid foundation in French. And then I started um, sitting in on, on graduate level French classes just, just for fun and, and uh, hanging out at the French table and stuff like that. And, and so I did a lot of talking in French. And I also started, you know, expanding my, my taste. So, like, this is one of the books that I, I bought there, um, Diderot Jacques Le Fataliste et Son Maître. And um, I still love the book now. It's a very funny book. And eventually I ended up um, writing my dissertation on this guy, Maurice Blondel. This is uh, L'Action 1893. Um, this is what I worked from. And I, you know, I didn't use the English translations unless I needed to because I, I had it. Um, this is a pretty typical look for a French book, too, by the way. Um, not recent French books, but, but you know, a lot of older French books. And, um, you know, I started doing translation eventually, well, actually fairly recently, I, I published a, a book of translations um, from the 1930s Christian philosophy debates in France, um, documents that, that I, I uh, uncovered here and there, um, mostly at the Notre Dame Library. I've got a video about that that, that I, can, I can link to here uh, at this point to, if you're interested in that sort of thing. And... Um, you know, I've just sort of kept up with it. I don't get a chance to speak much French anymore. And I don't hear quite so well, and that makes comprehension a little bit difficult in, in speaking. But I translate and I, I read French. Um, the most recent thing that I translated was a, a piece by a French scholar on Jus Gentium for uh, an encyclopedia. Um, so that's, that's French. Um, I used to be actually very nationalistic about about um, you know French Canadian things, but I, I kind of I'm not no longer quite so uh, quite so worked up about that sort of thing. So now German was a language that I had some exposure to when I was a kid, actually in elementary school. Um, one of the one of the people who lived up the street had been a, a, an exchange student in Germany, and she came to our classroom when I was in fourth grade, I think. 
and talked to us a little bit about, about her experience and taught us a little bit of German. And then um, in, in, in elementary school, and maybe I'll do a video about this some other time, I was one of those gifted, talented kids. But we lived out in the sticks, and they had no idea what to do with us. So they gradually just sort of phased us out of the, the regular classes and sent us off into the library or, you know, some room or some corner by ourselves. And, you know, so if you're good in English, they'd send you off, go find some books and do a project. It, and, and so I started learning German. Um, I found one of those Teach Yourself German books and, and kind of, you know, putzed around with it. I remember at least learning the numbers. Um, then... Um, I didn't do much with it for a very long time, um, and when I was in the army, I was stationed in Germany. So we had to take this German language class, um, you know, something very, very rudimentary. And um, I got through it, and I would, you know, I would talk with with native Germans from time to time, but I didn't do very much with it. And then again, once I got into college, really didn't do much with it either. Um, but that year, <coughs> that year that I, I um, took between graduate and undergraduate, I also focused on, on learning German. And the story of that is kind of interesting. Um, this is a very old Teach Yourself German book. It's called Lehrbuch der Deutschen Sprache, right? And what's really cool about this book, um, I'm going to hold this up so you can see, is it teaches you not just regular, you know, German stuff, but it teaches you this old script, which is called the Fraktur, which they don't they don't teach very much anymore. In part because you know after World War II there was a lot of changes, cultural changes that took place, and being able to read this old script means that I can read older German books that that some younger German people can't can't actually read unless they've learned the the Fraktur, um, and it's quite beautiful. There were some problems um, with, you know, I worked my entire way through this, this book and I would do a lot of exercises and drills and stuff like that. Um, one of the problems with this is that I didn't learn a lot of uh, modern contemporary vocabulary. So I remember actually asking somebody on a train, you know, for ein Feder, uh, literally a feather, but that was the old name for pen when I, I should have said, you know, Kugelschreiber. Um, and then, you know, here and there I would buy myself books when I could find them. This is Jakob's, Jakob Grimm's uh, Über die Deutsche Sprache. A lot of people don't know that the Grimm brothers were actually not just interested in uh, fairy tales. They were interested in fairy tales in part because they were interested in the German language. And in preserving that, they were part of this, this romantic movement. And Grimm was actually a linguist, uh, and the, this is his you know, discussions. Again, if you can't read the old script, this, this book wouldn't be very, very useful. Um, I got into other things as well. I tried to, I still haven't gotten around to this, but this is a, this is a uh, little book that I bought, I believe in Milwaukee. Um, it's uh, Der Lieb Nibelungen Not, uh, the, the story of the Nibelungen. Um, with a middle high German uh, grammar, so it's it's you know it's got the the poems. As you can see, somebody marked this up quite a bit. Um, and it, in the back, it actually has this entire uh, glossary. And um, maybe it's in the front. I haven't looked at this for a long time. Yeah, it has uh, a whole bunch of uh, stuff in German for teaching yourself middle high German. And so I, I used to try to work my way through that. I haven't done it for a while. Here's, here's another, uh, at this point, failed project. I was at one time going to teach myself Anglo-Saxon because it's, you know, it's fairly close. And again, this is one of those sort of books where it has the grammar and the start. And uh, if you know ordinary high German, well, then you can make some progress with that. Um, so I don't do that much with German these days. I mean, I read it, but I, I haven't gotten around to, you know, these things. Uh, it, it's a beautiful language. Um, a lot of people give it a bad rap, but, but it, you know, like French, it's a great language to have for research. Um, there's tons and tons of material out there that's not translated that is great to be able to access on, on the sort of things that I'm, I'm studying. So if I want to study Aristotle, for example, there's a lot of material in French, a lot of material in German that just hasn't made its way into to English.
Latin is a language that, again, I had some exposure to when I was a, a kid, but really, you know, I, I, I screwed around and didn't do any real work with it until I got into graduate school. Um, so here's the story with that. When I was in, in uh, what, sixth and seventh grade, I went to a private middle school, and I'll, I'll tell that whole story some other time. It's very interesting, but, but um, I don't want to get into those details. And one of the features of this middle school was that in sixth and seventh grade, you had to learn Latin one and Latin two. So I remember learning not an awful lot, but you know, a, a good bit, you know, for, for a middle schooler. Uh, we learned a lot of vocabulary and we learned, you know, at least the, the first and second declension. I don't think we learned the third declension and we learned, you know, some, some conjugations and that sort of thing. And I just sort of let it slide. And I remember, you know, getting out my dad's old Latin textbooks that he had when he was in high school, so he went to Catholic high school, and putzing around with them, but I, I didn't do too much with those either. Then, um, when I was in college, really didn't do anything with Latin either. And I didn't really do anything until I got to graduate school. And then um, I taught myself Latin. And again, it's a kind of weird idiosyncratic story. You know, I taught myself German out of that Teach Yourself German book from more than a century ago. Um, I taught myself Latin using a field manual that was written for uh, Army JAG officers for them to learn enough Latin to be able to, I don't know, do something with it, right? And I worked my way through the entire book. I was very disciplined at the time. I said, I'm going to learn Latin. And then that took me about a semester, and I thought, well, same thing that I did with French and the same thing that I did with German, I need to start reading some actual um, books, you know, some stories, something, so that I can um, actually, you know, develop my vocabulary. And this is the book that I actually picked out. This is Cicero's, uh, I was reading the Academica which is about um, Plato's Academy and, and, and how it turned to skepticism. So I got myself this from, the, not this actual copy, but this, this book from our library, and I started to try to work my way through it. Now, what, what's interesting about this, this is a Loeb Library edition. You can see that it has the Latin on one side and the English on the other side. So it's kind of good because if you get lost, you can actually like go to the English and see what's going on. And I underestimated how difficult Cicero would be. So after an entire next semester of working about an hour a day, I'd only made 10 pages progress in the whole thing, in part because Cicero is a very, is a very complex author, a lot of vocabulary. And he writes what are called Ciceronian periods, where you know you could, in Latin you can have these immense sets of clauses that are all nested within each other, uh, because you have you have case and, and you can you know make all these references, and it's very beautiful and it can convey very complex thoughts. But it, it was very tough for me to work my way through. So I had to admit defeat, and I said, "Wow, I gotta I gotta find myself um, <coughs> some resources." So I, I, I looked at, you know, I went to the bookstore, the university bookstore, and I said, well, what are they actually using to learn Latin? <clears throat> and they were using this, this wheel lock thing, which I'm not super impressed with. It's not bad, but it's, it's not, you know, isn't much better than the JAG book that I had. And they had this. This is Alan and Greeno's Latin grammar. And it's about, well, it's, it's uh, 490 pages long. It's very dense, and it covers just about everything that you can find in Latin grammar. So I worked my way through this entire book, treating it as a textbook, going over it bit by bit by bit. And that took me about another semester to do, a very intensive work, you know, spending several hours a day with it, because I really wanted to, to learn Latin well. It's great because it gives you tons of examples. The other thing I really love about this grammar is that the guys who, who worked on it were into Indo-European linguistics. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that matters when I get to the Greek stuff. So I, you know, I worked my way through that. And then I thought, well, i got to find some easier stuff to read. 
So what I did is I started with Thomas Aquinas. This is the Blackfriars translation, which again, English on one page, Latin on the other page. Um, you, can, you can get a whole set of volumes of these. This is the Summa Theologiae. And I wasn't getting any, any um, good Thomas Aquinas in my graduate program because they, they really had no interest in, in studying him. They were doing analytic and continental and American philosophy for the most part, not a lot of history of philosophy. So I thought, well, I should, I should read this guy. He's, he's pretty important. So I started working my way through the Summa Theologia. And I, 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 you know, I didn't get through the entire thing, of course. But I started reading it, and then I got captivated by it. I'm not a Thomist, but I'm a great admirer of Thomas Aquinas, in part because once you actually can start reading the stuff in Latin and you're not dependent on these translations, which sometimes are very good, but sometimes are, are rather misleading, a whole world opens up to you. And I started reading Thomas, and then after I'd read some Thomas, I thought, well, I need something a bit more challenging. I'm not going to try to take on Cicero right now or Augustine. Who would be kind of in the middle? And I found St. Anselm, and I started reading him. And, and there's a whole story about how I became a St. Anselm scholar that I'll, I'll tell in another, another video. Um, so that I just kept up with it. I, I eventually became part of the Thomas Aquinas Translation Project, which is run out of DeSalle University, um, and worked on translating some of Thomas's commentaries on the Psalms. And I've translated some other things in Latin. I'm working on a translation of, of a work by, by St. Anselm called the, uh, the, the English translation would be something like On Similitudes, uh, De Similitudinibus. Um, and I really enjoy working with Latin. Um, it, it opens up, like I said, a whole entire world for you when, you when you actually have it. Some people want to say, oh, it's a dead language. Those are people who don't realize how much is out there and how important languages are. Also, if you know Latin, it really helps you with, with English, uh, English uh, grammar and vocabulary, all that sort of stuff. Um, but even if you want to read, say, René Descartes, you know, Descartes wrote the meditations in Latin. Then they were translated into French, and now we read them in English, right? So if you want to see the original stuff, you want to read it in, in Latin. Now, uh, to Greek. And with this one, I actually did things the way that people generally ought to learn languages. I took classes in it. And at Southern Illinois University, we had this guy, Rick Williams, who was the head of the Classics Department and uh, also, I believe, the head of the Honors Program at the time. Um, he was a classicist, great guy. I loved working with him. And I, I had a friend, uh, Gary, who was, was studying Greek, in part because Gary was interested in Aristotle. And uh, Gary and I used to argue about Nietzsche all the time. Um, but in any case... I, um, Gary had, had studied Greek through the, the sequence, and he said it's going to really open things up for you. And I already had French and German and Latin, and I thought, well, you know, adding Greek to it would, would really clinch things for me. Um, so I started taking the, the course sequence, and we started out with 12 people in the first class, Greek, elementary Greek one, I think it was called. And... Only four people made it to the end of the semester because Greek is, is pretty tough, and you got to work your your butt off in order to, to master these things. It's a language like Latin that has case, and you know moods are important, and you got to memorize a lot of things. Um, so we started out with with uh, twelve, went to four. We started out the next semester with four, and only two of us finished. And I was the only person who went on and started doing readings after that. And I would do reading courses with um, some of the other instructors. So we started out with fairly easy stuff. Uh, we read Plato's Credo and some some uh, speeches, you know, fairly simple stuff. Then we read some Lucian that that first semester. And then we started diving into things like reading Herodotus, which you can learn a whole different vocabulary, and reading Homer. Again, a whole different vocabulary, and you know, it's got, you actually got its own dictionary for reading Homer. And then I started reading Plato and Aristotle in earnest in, in Greek. Um, you know, I read the symposium for an entire semester with Rick Williams. 
and I read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics for an entire semester with, with another guy who I don't remember, Johnson was his name, he, he, I don't think he's there anymore. Um, and again, with, with the Greek, it's very important to have a good Greek grammar. This is the Smythe, this is the same sort of deal as the Allen and Greeno. This is the gold standard. And this is, ba I mean, you know, this one is, is a very dense book, you know, 700 odd pages. And it goes through everything that we know about classic Greek grammar. Um, and I worked my way, again, through this entire thing. Thank God I did, because I'm so busy these days, I don't have time to keep up with all of this. And the foundation that I laid for myself is what I'm drawing on now. I don't, I don't have the time to do the intensive language study. But this is also based on Indo-European linguistics. So, you know, when we talk about Indo-European linguistics, we're, we're thinking about how the languages that, you know, form these great families, so the Celtic languages, the Italic languages that Latin comes from, and on the Romance languages after that, the, you know, Hellenic Greek, um, Hittite, Sanskrit, all these, these, these language families, Germanic, they all come from a common stem, Proto-Indo-European, which then spreads out into all these other uh, language families, and then they split up even more. Well, if you know one major Indo-European language, like German, and you go to start studying Greek, you've already prepared yourself for working with cases or thinking about conjugation. It makes it a lot easier to learn it. And here's a bit of a digression. When I was studying Greek, I realized that I tend to learn languages differently than many other people. Um, when it comes to a language, a language is a very complex interconnected system. And it has all sorts of what we call synchronic connections and then diachronic connections that, that reflect changes over time. And a lot of people like to look at the little bits and memorize all the little bits. So they do, you know, what are called paradigms. And, you know, first do a verb and go through all the persons and numbers for, for the present, uh, present indicative, then the imperfect, then the aorist, then the future, then blah, 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 blah right? Uh, memorize the, you know, principal parts of the verbs. I wanted to know the answers, well, why is this like that? I wanted to know what the rules were, and, you know, when you're studying a language, there seem to be all these sort of irregularities. Well, no, those are actually rule governed, too. It's just that you've got a whole bunch of different rules imposing on each other and modifying each other and changing their results slightly here and there and there. And what was great about the Indo-European grammar part was they had answers to the why for me. So if I learned that, I didn't need to necessarily memorize the way that other people did. I could deduce and derive. And it was, it was you know, at that point in my, my life, it was really something uh, that I, I, I found very fruitful and, and very exciting. You know, learning where do these stems all come from and why does this play out this way? And why does, you know, why is this error system of verbs over here, why do they have these, these endings? Um, I found that stuff fascinating. Um, another thing that you need if you're, if you're going to study languages is, of course, lexicons or, or dictionaries. This is what we call the, the little little, the little in Scott. Um, it comes in a little and a medium and a large, and the large is, you know, a giant book. Um, and the middle is okay. The, the, the little one is, is pretty good. It's got a lot of references, and it gives you the English for a lot of... Uh, a lot of the, the Greek things that you're going to come across. You have to know how to derive the Greek words um, because case and conjugation play, a, or declension and conjugation play major roles in Greek, of course. This is a different lexicon. This is a New Testament lexicon. And if, Greek, classical Greek, it includes more than one language, strictly speaking. You have different dialects. So Homer is a different dialect than Plato is, and what we call Koine, the Greek that was spoken by people in New Testament times, this is a, a Greek New Testament. So you can see, like this is the uh, uh, letter to the Romans, Prosor Miles. 
Um, it's all in Greek. And the Greek that Paul is writing, or the Greek that um, you know, Luke and Katalukaion is, is writing, is a somewhat different Greek than the Greek that Plato was writing, or somebody like, like Lucian is writing. Interestingly enough, well, here's another Loeb edition. This is Epictetus. And again, Greek on one side, English on the other, very handy. Epictetus is actually writing something that's kind of closer to Koine in some respects than to, to classic Attic Greek. Aristotle already, you can see some with certain verbs of the transition that's going on leading to Koine. Um, now, I, I do quite a bit of reading in Greek still, um, in part because once you can read the stuff in Greek, it opens up, like I said, entirely new vistas for you. You start seeing connections between things. The book that I'm writing on Aristotle and anger would not be possible if I couldn't read Aristotle in Greek and see that the same stuff is being talked about in this work over here as is being talked about in this work over here, but it's getting translated differently here than it is here because different people are focusing on these sorts of things. Um, so I, I really enjoy um, working with Greek, and um, I haven't translated anything yet. I may, you never know, but I'm, I'm content to to uh, just provide the translations in, in the articles that I write on Aristotle and eventually on Epictetus. There are a few other languages that I have, I would just say, putzed around with, um, and I haven't learned an awful lot, or what I have learned I've managed to forget, um, to my chagrin. And a lot of that has just been a product of my own laziness because, you know, like I said, I have, I have a facility for languages, so when I actually do buckle down, I can, I can learn quite a bit. Um, I've been to Portugal, and I learned a bit, a bit of Portuguese. You know, I bought some Portuguese books and really haven't gotten around to consolidating anything. You know, I can actually, like, I can, I can read this stuff out loud, but, um, you know, como a filosofia é triste a rida. Um, as vezes na primavera o vento norte. You know, but the comprehension is a whole different matter. I'm able to make some sense out of the Romance language things on the basis of the French and the, the Latin that I have, surprisingly enough. So I can, I can hear sometimes people speaking in Spanish and understand what they're saying. I can read some Italian, some Spanish, and, and puzzle it out if it's not too jargony or too rich or, or anything like that. Portuguese is a beautiful language, and in a lot of respects it sounds less like Spanish and more like French. It's got a lot of sibilants in it, you know, zzz and so sounds like that. And if I have the time, I would love to actually learn it. You know, my, one of my big goals is eventually to read the Portuguese national epic, O Xuxidadas, in, in Portuguese, but that may have to wait for a while. That's, that's one of the things on my bucket list. Um, what else? I tried to teach myself Italian, and didn't get very far with it, unfortunately. That's a pretty complex language, particularly in its, its uh, verb structure. So that would have taken some time. I, I can puzzle out enough to be able to read articles on, you know, the Christian philosophy debates or on Anselm or thing, Thomas Hobbes or things like that. But I can't really, like, sit down with an Italian book and, you know, like I couldn't read Dante, for example, <laughs> or uh, even sit down with, the, with, you know, an Italian newspaper and figure out what I'm reading. Um, the other main language that I have dabbled with and um, I'm really ashamed to say I haven't done much with is Chinese and Mandarin specifically. Um, I took a Chinese class, uh, an intensive, what we call Wintrim class, where it was, you know, one month, three hours a day, and I learned quite a bit in that. Um, and I still have the, the, the reader that we used for that, um, but I, I didn't follow through with it. And I, you know, I know enough to say, you know, um, I speak a little bit of Chinese, but then after that people start talking at me and I'm like, a, you know, I don't know what, what you're saying. Um, and I can order a few things at a Chinese restaurant. I can ask for water and, you know, I'd like the chicken or things like that, but, but I really can't do 
what I ought to be able to do with it. And it's a real shame because, uh, you know, if, if I had to pick um, three languages that I think are most important for, um, for kids to be learning right now, I would say Spanish, Mandarin, and possibly Arabic. Um, so, you know, Mandarin is a great language to have. I used to have more facility with it. I never learned that many characters, um, in part because, I, again, I didn't apply myself as I ought to have. Um, trying to see if I can find my little thing. I copied all these, these uh, Chinese proverbs into a notebook, which then I, I studied uh, over some time as well. But um, I didn't follow through with it, and it's really a shame because I used to tutor Chinese students. So I had I had people that I, I learned quite a bit from, but I could have really learned a lot more. Um, so, you know, maybe down the line I'll actually learn Chinese as, as I ought to. It would be a very useful language to have um, some facility with. They have a great Chinese philosophical tradition that goes back, you know, just as far as the... the Greek philosophical tradition, the Western philosophical tradition, it would be lovely to be able to read it. Um, there's a few other languages I, I wish I had, you know, I, I would love to be able to read Hebrew. Um, it would be great to know uh, Russian so I could read, you know, Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn and people like that in the original. But, you know, when you come down to it, you've only got so much time and when you learn a language, it's, it's not like you learn it and then there's a chip in your head that stays there and it's always active. You have to keep working with it or else you start, it gradually starts to, to disappear. And um, you want to keep working and working and working on it. Um, and that takes away time that you could be spending learning new languages. So really, you, you have to pick and choose what you're going to work with. For Western philosophy, I would say that, of course, you know, the big five are English, French, German, Latin, and Classical Greek. Uh, it would be really nice to have Italian along with that, um, but that usually doesn't, doesn't uh, figure in for most people. Having five is, is, uh, is enough for, for me, I think. Um, I can't make any claims to be, you know, at, at super high expert level, but I can usually muddle through, and that's, that's what I, I need for my kind of work. And, um, yeah, I think that's probably enough about languages.